Well, welcome and thank you everyone for joining us for our A to J author uh, new user webinar in the summer. It's the summer highlight series. Today with me, I have Alexander Rabinow from uh, Chicago Kent Law School and Alex and I worked together for many years working on A to J and when I was at Chicago Kent. So I asked him to come in and talk a little bit about how he is using A to J author and document assembly to teach legal technology to his law students. So Alex, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your organization and your role um, in the law lab and how you became involved with document assembly and technology? Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jessica, for inviting me and um, hello to everybody on the webinar. Really appreciate the time to talk a little bit about uh, my course and also how I'm using A2J Author. Um, I teach at Chicago Kent College of Law. I've been teaching for about seven years now. Uh, my focus is in legal technology uh, and innovation generally, uh, with a particular focus on using technology to help close the justice gap. So I've had um, I've been fortunate enough to have had a, a number of years to think think about these issues and, um, in particular, use. Uh, A2J author in the course of my teaching. I started in legal innovation technology uh, through a fellowship um, coming into Chicago Kent. And um, you know, at the time, I'd sort of generally been interested in technology, but hadn't really given it much thought in terms of um, you know, a career path and also uh, a means of teaching uh, in, in the law school setting. So I um, started with the fellowship and um, had an opportunity to work um, on um, A2J author projects, namely a project uh, helped helping other law schools to um, uh, start their own A2J author cl classes and um, had a really great time doing that and got to learn a lot about the program through that experience. Um, and as Jessica mentioned, I had a, the good fortune of um, working with her um, uh, over the course of uh, many years, working on projects like that, and then also just getting to know the program on the back end. Um, and so um, that really helped to push forward my interest in innovation technology. And through that, um, I was able to um, work in our what we're now calling the Law Lab, which is really um, a continuation of some of the work that we were doing at Chicago Kent prior um, through a center called the Center for Access to Justice and Technology. Now, um, the law lab is is more broadly focused on legal innovation technology, um, and so I'm I'm happy to continue our focus on A2J as part of our program there. Um, and as I mentioned, I've been teaching for about seven years now, and teaching a class in justice and technology, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and also teaching a class in professional responsibility, and then also um, in years past, I've also taught an intro to. Uh, legal innovation technology. So um, that's a bit of my interest. Um, and, you know, we can talk a little bit about Chicago Kent's role in helping to facilitate not only my own interest in innovation technology, but then also getting uh, more students to start thinking about this um, very critically. That seems so long ago and also yesterday, like seven, <laughs> seven years ago that yeah. uh, I was just doing a presentation for the Cali conference talking about teaching law students uh, using A2J author and how that helps build empathy and that kind of thing. And I found an old picture uh, of us from one of those original A to J course project meetings. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's our little was, baby pictures. <laughs> was, was it the one with the, with the shirts, with the yeah. colorful All shirts? The bright yeah. yellow Cali shirts. Yeah, yeah. those were lovely. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so why don't we talk a little bit then about uh, Chicago Kent's uh, document automation origin story. So Chicago Kent has been a project uh, partner with A to J Author um, since the beginning. And um, why don't you talk a little bit about how Chicago Kent got involved in uh, document automation? Yeah, absolutely. Chicago Kent has been really one of the law school leaders in technology and innovation Um you know, e even for many years before we started working on A2J with Cali. Um, I really think much of the credit goes to Professor Stout, Professor Ron Stout, um, who's now Emeritus Professor here at Chicago Kent. Um, and if we even take it back to, you know, the the mid, early to mid 80s, when he was spearheading teaching classes with computers, um, which at the time was a, you know, a very novel thing. And nowadays, you know, it's, it's you know, a commonplace um, way of learning in law school. Um, but at the time, it really wasn't. Um, and through a number of other initiatives really helped to spearhead um, technology to the forefront of um, not only Chicago Kent, but also, you know, a lot of the other law schools um, in thinking about how to use technology, both for pedagogical purposes, but then also 
um, in an applied manner. So here, using technology to help close the justice gap. Um, I think the next big development was you know, either, and Jessica, you can tell me if I'm getting the years right, but 99 to two, 2001 or so, um, this, the meeting the needs study along with the Illinois Institute of Technology's School of Design um, and Chicago Kent, um, which was uh, a lengthy study in terms of how self-represented litigants use the courts, what their experience was like in dealing with difficult and complex legal issues without the assistance of a lawyer. Um, and I believe the report itself was published in 2001. Um, and there were a lot of really great insights um, that came out of the report. And, and one of them, I think critically, was just the fact that individuals who don't have access to legal rep representation um, are significantly hampered in their ability to, to really meaningfully access justice, right? We, we use that term often, access to justice, but I think what we're really looking for is access to uh, meaningful access to justice. And 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 that that study re really helped to um, highlight the fact that many litigants just were not getting that. And through that folding in technology, um, I think in two, 2004, um, with the partnership with Cali, A2J, A2J Author came about. Um, and it's been going strong ever since so not i think that takes us what to 20 years now of a2j author right. uh, it it's, might have been earlier <laughs> it's interesting how the the study the meeting the needs study which is available on a2j author's website and also chicago kent's uh website that that sort of historical document that's now you know 25 years old almost is still applicable like the same problems that people were seeing uh there with self-represented litigants not having meaningful access and having um, problems with the physical forms, like that's still a problem and it's still valuable research, um, even though it's, you know, 25 years old. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a stark reality, right? Like you, like you said, it's been decades now uh, since that, that, that report was published. And yet a lot of the concerns are still relevant today, if maybe if not more so. You know, sometimes with technology, I think it helps a lot. But then also we have to deal with the fact that some individuals aren't aren't comfortable using technology and then whether they even have access to the technology. So there are different variations to the same concerns, I think, that we saw in that meeting, meeting the needs study. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that, you know, the program, a program like A2J Author has been able to, to help to bridge that gap. Yeah. So tell us um, about your course. Then. How do you structure the... Um... The eight, this tying it into like modern technology, right? So document automation, like we said, it's 20 years old. Um, we've been teaching these sort of courses, but how is it still relevant in your course structure? How do you use it? Yeah, so I, A2J author, um, at least in my course, so I, just a bit of a background. Um, my course is called the Justice and Technology Practicum, which was a, a course that Professor Stout started in 2010 um, in a different variation of it. Um, the current offering that I have is a two credit hour class. And I have a few a few learning objectives. First is I really want the students to understand that we have an access to justice problem in the civil justice space. And I think access to justice, you know, students have probably heard that prior to coming into the class. Uh, but really what I want to do is unpack what that term means um, in its different components. And so I spend the first you know few weeks really introducing the, the problem space to the students. And then from there, building on what technology can we use? Can we really leverage um, that has, one, been in the space for many years? So longstanding technology that has proven results. And two, is accessible to the students. It's something that they can understand. Something that, uh, you know, even for those who uh, have no experience whatsoever using technology, and I have most of my students will come in and say, Listen, I don't, you know, I don't come in with a CS degree. I've not, you know, not, I've not worked in the tech industry, and that's fine. Actually, that's that's perfect for what what I'm trying to do, and I think a number of other educators are trying to do in this space, which is really just to introduce them to this really impactful and accessible technology um, that courts, legal aids, uh, law schools have been using for many years. Um, and then at, in about the middle of the course is when I start to introduce A2J author. I say this is a use a really great use case for document assembly and form automation. 
Um, you know, I also tell them, you know, there are, there are other programs out there that, you know, courts are using and legal aids are using. Um, this is this is the program that we're teaching in this class for, you know, for a number of reasons, you know, both for the the connection to the institution, you know, the fact that A2J out there has been used millions of times. Um, it's been used all across the U.S. and even in some international jurisdictions. So I like to use it as an example of something that has widespread use and something that has had a fairly lengthy history, I think more so than other programs. And we work in A2J out there for about four to five weeks. And I, I mean, when I say we work in it, I mean, we really spend the, the whole class basically just working in the program. So a lot of it is really just, you know, going through the weeds in the program, you know, taking them through all the different button clicks and the different features and the different windows. So that part of the class can get a little, can be a little slower. But, you know, I'm always trying to tie it back to to the the principles that um, the course is really about, which is the technology itself is a means to help us to close the gap. So don't don't forget the fact that we're using this program to help people who don't have lawyers complete important court forms, which, you know, for better or worse, is still really the language of courts. Like we can't get around that. Like this is really, you know, if you want something done, if you want the court to do something got to file a motion, right? If you want to start a case, it's a complaint, right? These are the things that that are are have, that haven't changed for many, many years. And the technology itself is just really a means to help individuals to access those features of the court. And so we work in the program for about five weeks, really just intensely. And through that, I use, you know, what I've been calling modules, which are basically assignments that teach, that, that really test students at different levels. So the first one is really an introduction, no document assembly component to it, really just trying to get students to under, to think about issues like writing plainly, writing clearly, designing their questions in a way that is user-friendly for you know the, the person using the program. And then it gets a little bit more complex in the second one. And then the third one is, is really a culmination of both the, the guided interview, the A2J guided interview, and then the document assembly component. And then the last part of the class is, is um, I, I use that really to um, focus on a couple of special topics and, and trying to introduce various other ways that technology has been used in the access to justice space. But really is a, you know, a, a centerpiece of the class as, a, as a, you know, a primary example of how to use document assembly and form automation and, you know, showing students that this is a program that has been used many times across many jurisdictions. So you said in the, in the beginning of your course, you spend a lot of time talking about the access to justice crisis before you dive into the software. Do you find that your students are aware of the, the crisis? Like I, when I was helping to teach this course, I always found that it was eye opening, even for me, that like you, even as law students, you think about law as law and order and, you know, access to a lawyer and you, you can always get a free lawyer if you need it. And there's a real, it was a real eye opener to see the difference between criminal law and civil law and how many things are not covered by your, um, you know, right to an attorney. And just, just the whole understanding that there is this world out there where people are having to deal with really life changing issues without, um, without any help basically. And so I always found, I found it eye-opening for myself, but I also found that the, that it was eye-opening for the law students, that they are sort of in their law school bubble, and that um, this is introducing them to an area of the law where they may not have um, have touched before in law school. Yeah, I think it's still very much the same. The students, right, they come into law school with some inclination that they want to help, uh, regardless of what practice area they go into, right? They, I think for most students, that's one of the motivators for going into law school is that they understand that there are a number of individuals who need legal assistance and legal representation. And in some small way, they want to play a part in that. Um, for others, it you know it becomes really their career focus and you know they want they want to work in public interest and they want to work in legal aid. And um, you know, I do we certainly have a number of students that that have that career focus, but a lot of a lot of students are are really just taking a flyer on the class as well. They just want to know what is this justice and technology class all about. Um, and just as you said, Jessica, it, I think students are aware that you know that that there are individuals out there who need help but don't have access to an attorney. In much the, you know, I think they're aware that we have in the criminal space, criminal justice space, we have a right to an attorney through Gideon but that there isn't anything, there isn't an analog in the civil justice space. And yet a lot of the issues that are really pressing litigants 
are ones that affect you know the core of their livelihoods right whether it's housing or employment or family issues um, where having the assistance of an attorney i think objectively right and there's data on this that that show that you get objectively better outcomes when you have a lawyer representing you um, so i think they're aware of that uh, but when we start to delve into some more i'd say delving into the issue in a more granular level when you talk about things like even access to technology or you know language access or even just the practical concerns that somebody would need, that somebody has in order to to have their day in court right and so we spend some time talking about like what is it what does it take for somebody to actually appear in court right and and these are issues that sort of you know they they predate the pandemic and then we 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 start to see some more you know remote appearances because of the pandemic but a lot of it still remains the same you know for individuals get you have to take time off work you've got to find childcare all of those things affect their ability to access justice and i think it, it really does become more real to the students when we start talking about those other issues apart from the fact that yes we we know that people don't have attorneys and they want to be a part of of the solution to that effect um, but there are all, all all sorts of things that affect individuals ability to access justice meaningfully so I know under uh, in Ron's course, he had a 20 hour requirement for either observing court or participating in the self-help web center. Do you still have that kind of requirement or do you have some sort of interaction with the target population that the students are trying to make these guided interviews for? Yeah, I, so I don't have that requirement anymore. And I think that's uh, for a few reasons, right? So one is the shift to the two credit hour offering. And that was you know, and and you and I have had some discussions about how to you know uh, to to best structure the course in terms of one. I think if the primary objective is really to teach a two G author to the students, you really do need to spend a significant part of the class just really working with the program. Um, so you know, let's assume you know we have got like 13, 13 weeks in the semester. You know, a good chunk of it, I'd say that's why really I spend the middle portion of the class really doing nothing but a two J author and you absolutely need that because you know for the students who who've never worked in a program like this it's it's accessible enough that they can understand it but actually doing the work and understanding the various screens and buttons and everything that's going to take some time even for somebody who is comfortable working with technology so i found that because we need to focus more on the actual program itself that that offers less time to work with um, legal aid organizations and do a, a practical component to this, and not not to say that there it really um, that that wouldn't be a worthwhile thing. And and as you mentioned, that was you know at the beginning of the course, that's how it was structured. Um, when we were doing the A2G author course project, right, a lot of those classes were clinical classes where A2G author was used as a, a way to facilitate the clinical activities of the class. So they're really, I mean. There's a there's a certainly a place for those kind of classes. I just found for for my purposes in teaching this class, you know, my my primary objective was I really want to teach students how to use the program against the backdrop of uh, teaching them about the access to justice crisis, and it just wasn't feasible to do in two credit hours. And and another reason why we shifted to two credit hours is was to be able to scale this class out a little bit more. So I'm offering it now. Um, in both semesters, where I used it to only teach it in one semester. So I'm getting both JD students. And then also our the law school is growing out its our LLM program in legal innovation technology. And so now I'm teaching uh, the class to LLM students as well. So it really worked out best for us to be able to do two credit hours across both semesters and really focus on the teaching of the, the teaching of A2G author as the centerpiece of the tech part of the class. Yeah, I like that idea that it can be more accessible so more people are exposed to it, but there are always the options for those that are on the call um, to have a more in-depth. So Ron Stout's original course was four credits, very intensive. I mean, that's a huge credit load. That's a third to a quarter of your credits um, mm -hmm. for the semester that the students are taking on. And I think as we learned that um, different iterations of this, it fits into different kinds of courses. So yours is a two credit model, Ron's is a four. We've had it in professionalism courses. We've had introductions in larger mm -hmm. legal technology courses that this is only, you know, one week where we come in and talk about the access to justice crisis and technology in a larger technology course. 
But yeah, that there are different ways to structure this depending on the needs of your student population and also the faculty that are available to teach it. And that, like a little understanding that as I understand it, your courses, you aren't you aren't partnering with any legal aid organizations or courts. And so you're not producing any real projects. But a lot of the real projects that I worked on when I was doing this never made it to that that final step because of this sort of student structure of the semester that 14 weeks, like you said, it it takes time to get up to speed on the software and then to produce a high quality product that's actually going to be live for self-represented litigants. It needs some more polishing than usually can fit within, you know, that last half of the semester structure. So if you are all interested in teaching a course like um, Alex's or like other ones that just an understanding that you're not you're not likely to get a fully polished, ready to go self-represented litigant project at the end of the semester from the students. It's just not there needs to be some um, expectation setting, too, for these kind of things that. The yeah, students are absolutely. learning, and so they're not necessarily producing, um, you know, the best quality or the the final product. Yeah, I, I and again, you know, you can absolutely use A two J author in the clinical course. You just need more credit hours to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, as Jessica mentioned, I mean, th- this is really, um, you know, t- what the students would have to do is learn the program. Obviously, understand the the background principles of a- um, access to justice, um, and then also working with legal or aid organizations, um, I think is a, it's an unknown, right? Because you never know both the time that the students have and also the legal aids have, what their expectations are. Um, I think you really need to foster that relationship over the course of maybe even a year. Uh, and that probably would be more effective than doing it in a four credit hour class um, in a semester. Um, it, was re- it was very ambitious, right? And I think uh, the students learned a lot, but then also probably needed a little more time uh, to work with the actual legal aid organizations um, in addition to learning the program. So speaking of the students, what do you see from the students in terms of their reactions to your course or what are you getting back? I know you you get sort of student feedback um, both formally at the end of the semester and informally throughout. How how are they reacting to a course like yours? I'd say they they, uh, react uh, overall very positively to the course. I think one of the things that they really liked about the, the course is that it's a, a course unlike other courses they've had in law school. That's one of the comments I get pretty consistently throughout um, the semesters is that this is a different type of class, right? It's it's um, you know it's a not, it's not a doctrinal class, although I do mix in some case cases in, into our syllabus. Um, it's not, you know, a clinic class, but we do have an experiential component to it. It's not, you know, um, it's not a seminar class, although we do um, we do go through a number of different readings throughout the semester. So it's really a nice combination of the other types of classes that students get. But it's also unique in the sense that um, you're really spending a bulk of the semester just with the technology part of the class. Um, and that's, I think, something that the students have really enjoyed. You know, on the, on the flip side, some of their concerns have been just, you know, some frustrations with troubleshooting, right? You know, they're not, uh, and, you know, you and I remember some of the instances where students have sent us frantic emails about where, you know, I can't find my guide interview or things like that. But I always tell students, listen, that's just going to be given. I, I I try to set the table at the very beginning of the semester. Like, look, we have this really great program, but you're going to you're going to experience bugs you're going to experience you know issues where you you don't quite know the answer to it and i think that's really fertile ground for for learning for students it's like it's good for you to troubleshoot and frankly i would rather they do that i would rather they encounter some problems where they have to really think critically about how to for example structure their logic statements or you know there's something amiss with their repeat loop and oftentimes it's just like one or two characters are off and they and and it, it does lead to frustration. But you know, if you spend some time working through it, testing, doing different iterations of the loop, I mean, you'll you'll get to it at some point. Or or maybe you won't. And I and I tell the students, if you get to that point, shoot me an email, let me know ahead of time that you're working on this. And it, it's not gonna count against you because um I think the process of troubleshooting, the the process of working through the problem is just as important as getting a polished final piece, right? Obviously, that's what we're working toward. But, you know, even even with the restraints that we have in a tour of credit arc, it's just not it's not possible. So I just want you to give your good faith effort in trying to solve this. And I think the students are they learn a lot from that. Um, it, 
they they do get frustrated about it, but I think overall it's it's a good experience for them. Um, so long as you know they're able to turn it like you know isn't something that's like absolutely okay. critical, like they they lost their work or something like that, and and that's that's not very frequent at all. And and we can usually find find out what happened to it. Um, yeah, I think it's that, interesting so. with with law students. You know, they're you're a law student. You've already you're already very smart. You already sort of know how to work a school system. You know, in, in education. And you get into a course like this and you're touching software that you might not, you're obviously not familiar with, or you're not familiar with software at all. And, um, you know, those panicked emails at three in the morning when they've been working on something the day before it's due. And a lot of times I see those and the students just, you know, ultimately by five, eight, whatever, a couple of hours later, they get to a point where like, oh, I actually figured it out. I, I forgot to do, you know, the if statement correctly, or like you said, like just figuring out how to do a repeat loop or a logic statement that it the the trying it and working through it and something being hard for them is actually good growth for the law students to have because school's probably not been hard, very hard for them for the most part. Um, and yeah. that this is, is trying their brain in a way that the same way you have to learn how to do blue book and you have to learn how to structure your sentences and structure arguments. Like this is another way of learning to think like a lawyer because those logic statements require the same sort of logical um, thinking that other areas of, of your practice are going to need. Yeah, I, I, it's it's something that I have grown to uh, embrace as part of the class. And I think is particularly as an instructor, too, is that I, you know, I, I try to tell the students, I've been working in this program for many years, and I don't know, there's still a lot of things that I, I don't know about, right? Um, there are new features that are getting pushed out, you know, new developments. Maybe there's there's some bug fixes that I'm not aware of. And or even just um, one of the great things is that students are sometimes thinking about ways to use the different features in a 2 j author that I had never thought about before. Um, so sometimes I'll take, you know, the first 20 minutes or so and just take questions from the students and and it'll say like, hey, I was trying to do this logic statement and I'm just not getting it. So we'll actually do it together in the class, the first part of class. And I'll say, like, well, how would we do this? You know, or like, we'll do it. And if it doesn't work, then we'll try another statement or we'll try something else. And um, I think, you know, it takes a little vulnerability from the instructor to say, like, to, to give up a little bit of that expertise. Right. Because with technology, it's rapidly changing all the time, even for a program that that we that I've I've been working on for for 10 years now is is you know, I, I, I know how to use it. I know how to teach it. Uh, but there, there are new things all the time that are coming out of, of AT Jata, which is great. And again, new things that even I hadn't thought about before, which is, is something I, I would love to see more from the students. And I really want to encourage them to, to, to come to class and thinking through, you know, how to use different functions, for example. Right. And so like one of the functions is like trying to give an example here, like the contain function where they'll try to do some really complex logic statement looking for particular keywords in the guided interview and that triggers a number of different uh, different sequences in the guided interview and um, I've seen more students really do that and some students are, aren't comfortable using that and that's fine and you just you, you know you it, it, one of the things I like using uh, about using the program is that it it can reach students across various different levels of of comfort with technology and so yeah it's it's been it's been good to do a lot of that collaborative work with the students as well. I like uh, you explaining that you need to be a little bit vulnerable as a, as a teacher in this, because mm -hmm. a lot of the problems we see, maybe faculty are hesitant to teach a course like this because they aren't familiar with the software. So some of that on the A to J author side is the pushback that you we have help for you. Like we have training exercises, we have training materials. I'm here to answer questions from the students, sort of help as a TA. But um, in that original A to J uh, author course project that the faculty were very nervous to be vulnerable. And I like that you sort of embrace that. Like, I don't know, like, there, I mean, I work in A to J every day. And as I was building out our new training materials um, for the past six months, there'd be stuff that I was like, oh, I didn't know it did that. And I like literally live in the software day in and yeah. day out. And that it's just interesting to see to let to be vulnerable but to know that we have help and that um you know if there is something you can't get just like the students like at a certain point you are banging your head on the wall just shoot us an email and you know we can help yeah. uh figure it out or troubleshoot it and that there's yeah, new I, stuff that pops up all the time 
Yeah, I'm happy. And I, I'm happy to share Jessica's con email and contact information with the students. I'm like, you can you can speak to the person who wrote the book on A2J author, right? It's like, uh, you know, there are a lot of resources here that are available to help you get through this. Even though, as much as I I try to structure the course to um, offer students a consistent experience semester to semester, some semesters are different. Some semesters I get more. Um, I, I, there, there needs to be a lot more one-on-ones with students, for example, like, you know, a couple of semesters ago, I, or, uh, I felt like the students were really asking a lot more questions than in previous, um, semesters. And that could be for a number of different reasons. It could just be, maybe the students are, um, more vocal about expressing what their concerns are, or, or maybe it's just, there were, I don't know, for whatever reason, maybe there were more technical issues at that, at that point, other semesters, they, they seem to go a little bit um, smoother. Um, and yet, even in those more, you know, those smoother semesters, I still get a number of questions on the tech side of things. Um, and for the most part, I'm able to answer them a lot of times, though. Um, it, it takes a little bit of time, right? It's so if you're teaching the class, right? Um, sometimes the answer may not come to you right away. Um, but if you work in the program enough, at, at least you'll know, you, you'll just sort of sense what the issues are. Um, so it, 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 it's a little bit like issue spotting on the student side of things, right? You just kind of know what the, generally what the problems are, and then you have to refresh a little bit some of your own knowledge about the program. But, but again, it's, it's, it's a program that I think, as Jessica noted, you know, it, it does bring some trepidation for, for potential instructors to, to introduce this program into their classes. But I can assure you from teaching this class for um, a number of years now that you can, it, it's not something to be concerned. Like, don't let that be an impediment to offering a class uh, in A2J author or even just document assembly generally, I think is, is a, it's a great applied technology to introduce to your courses because, you know, one, it's, it's been in the legal industry and in the legal profession for many, many years. So this is something that is highly relevant. Organizations, you know, across the industry and profession have used this technology for many years. Um, and it's also something, you know, at least I can speak to on the A2J author side is, and something I mentioned before is something that you can offer to students across various skill levels from both, you know, I've had students, I've had a, you know, for example, I had a, a CS student um, last fall who was like, I really want to do this and I really want to do that. And I'm used to, you know, being able to do this, this, and this, and this. And even though I told them like, there's some limitations to this, he was able to creatively come up with a, a solution to what he was trying to do. And it just, you know, it was it was a really good learning experience on that front. So you can really reach all, you know, students across the spectrum of expertise with a program like this. So I am not in the in the bandwagon that says that all lawyers need to know how to code, but I think all lawyers need to know whether technology is being legitimate or not, or mm -hmm. what its boundaries are. Like you need, you need, like you said, you need to know sort of where there's where you can work through it and where it's an actual problem. And so that's sort of like intellectual honesty in the software itself. And that as a consumer, then as a lawyer consumer, you will know how to apply your ethical boundaries as being a lawyer to software as well. So, you know, the AI, the metadata, like the stuff that you're going to need to do day in and day out. It, having a course like this teaches you to question it and to try and to poke it and try to debug it. But you don't have to be a pro you don't have to be that computer science student. You don't have to have a background in programming to be a lawyer nowadays to be an effective consumer of the technology once you graduate. So I think that is something that a course like this teaches the law students where they might not be getting that in other courses. Yeah, I agree 100. percent I yeah. I definitely think that you know there, there's been a lot of discussion the, the discourse in academia and both and not just in academia, but but just across the profession and industry generally has been like, you know, to what extent do we want lawyers to be technologists, right? And, um, you know, I 100% I agree that we, we don't need lawyers to be, we, actually, I think it would be beneficial if lawyers weren't that because otherwise, you know, they would probably just choose a different profession, right? I mean, really want lawyers to, to focus on things that they, they go to law school for, that they, you know, that they gain experience through their clerkships and internships and, and working in, you know, practicing in law. Um, we really want them to focus on that. But we also, critically, I think, I, I think, although it, it shouldn't be, you know, their, the main function of, of a 21st century lawyer, but I think it's, it's a necessary part of what they should be doing because new technologies are, are emerging every single day, um, every single week, right? And, and 
I think for a lawyer, you want to be conversant in in these technologies. You want to be able to know, okay, if you don't know the answer, where to look, um, how to have meaningful conversations about using technology, you know, in your law firms, in if you're working in, in the courts, how to use technology to help um, litigants better access the courts. Um, I, I do think, you know, it's, it's, and I'm very happy to see that, you know, in a number of states now, we have many, many states that require, you know, tech CLEs to be, to continue to know about technology. It's, it's, really, it's baked into our professional responsibility to uh, be competent in technology, um, both understanding the risks and benefits of it. So yeah, hundred, hundred percent agree. And, and this, again, just continuing to um, encourage instructors um, who, who are thinking about teaching a class like this, that it's, it's very doable. And I think at least in my experience, it's been very rewarding as well. So what's one piece of advice you would give to pro- professors who are thinking about starting uh, a course like yours, or, or if you're a legal aid organization or a court here with us who are thinking about starting document automation, like what do you have like advice to give them to get kick started? Yeah. Um, I, so I, I can speak probably um, more specifically to um, any instru- instructors out there. Um, and then also I can speak sort of generally to other institutions about document assembly. I say, if you have any interest whatsoever in introducing, if you've thought about it, even like 10% of, of your of your syllabus, you want to devote to document assembly or some piece of legal technology, I'd say do it. Because um, if you don't do it now, it, it's one of those things where you kind of just push it off to the side. And it's like, it's one of the constraints I think about law school that's been, you know, concerning to me is that we, we you know, in our doctrinal classes, we never get to see the technology that practitioners are using. We never get to see, that's something you can't escape, right? I mean, you, you have to learn the principles of contracts. You have to learn, you have to learn the law and torts and property. I mean, and that's, I think that's just a given. Like we, we just sort of give that up um, in our doctrinal classes, but other, in other classes, like when we have, you know, two L's and three L's, we have the flexibility to, to introduce a class like this. And I'd say if you've thought about it, even just, like I said, even if it, you just had a little inkling of interest in doing that, Go ahead and do it because it doesn't have to be the centerpiece of the class. It doesn't have to be a class that you spend 13 weeks using this technology. It can be a a piece of the class, and maybe you build on it every semester to where you, you know you you're more comfortable offering five to six weeks in instruction in the class or something like that. And and again, it's one of those things where it's it's a piece of technology that is that you're not really just teaching for technology purposes, right? You're you're teaching it because there is a connection to to what people are doing on the ground, um, to what institutions have been doing for many years. So it's a really good piece of technology to introduce into a class that's relatively easy to do. Obviously, there, it's going to take some a little bit of prep and and um, and some planning ahead of time. But it, it's also a really good. I I found that it's a it's also a really good tool to use just for other purposes, right? So one of the great things you can teach in A2Joth is just really thinking about how we communicate. So whether it's how do we communicate more plainly or, um, you know, one, one of my favorite classes is just the, the class on question design, right? That, um, you know, Jessica, obviously, you know, very familiar with this is like, how, how you know, how do we ask questions across these various screens that we're seeing in, in A2J author, right? Is it, do we just want to dump a bunch of information on one page is it better to split up the information across various pages? Do we want to use buttons versus drop-down lists? Like how how is it that individuals are seeing this visually and responding to it? So even those things we can teach through a program like a 2 j Author that it isn't really necessarily tied to you know form automation, but is critical to that task. Um, so I would say like if you if you're interested in go for it um you know reach out to jessica and callie and see you know see if you can set up a class or, or even just even like a one or two week introduction or maybe even do you know a demo for for one week just to kind of get students to know that this is out there i think if you if you if you if you do it sooner rather than later i think you, you'll be you'll be happier for it yeah one of my favorite courses classes to teach was the plain language one so similar to the question design but like really thinking about we pay a lot of money as law students to learn these fancy words and we, you know, propers and pro se and petitioner respond like, great. We learn all these fancy words. And like, you feel very accomplished as a one L in those doctrinal courses, because you know what the words mean, 
But someone with a fifth grade reading level coming to those same documents, that's very intimidating. And so there is an art form in translating the legal knowledge into something that's digestible. And uh, that so that course sort of seeing not just in law or not just in the like in government space, you can see it out in the wider world and the interactions that there are plenty of places that could use plain language and that it's not talking down to people. It's not babyfying it. It's actually just making it more digestible for everybody. Um, and it's funny that video on our Ada J author YouTube channel just recorded it for a class um, like we've been talking about that has like like 3000 views on just that one video. And it's like our one of our most popular videos and it's so old and it's like poor, you know, it's, it's <laughs> 12 years old, but there's a need for that in the wider world. And so that's also another really important skill, teaching, taking the law and actually speaking to people in a way in which they can handle it. That's also a really important skill for lawyers to learn. Anything else you wanna tell us about like the other legal technology that you're seeing in uh, in law schools or um, because I'm again, a glutton for punishment, anything you'd like to change in A to J author or how we could better support law schools that are doing this? If there's one thing I could, I would change in A to J author is I, I would like some more flexibility with formatting in the text template in the DAT, the, the document assembly tool. Um, so if, so as part of my class, I teach the form automation part. And then in the, toward the latter part of the class is when we introduce the document assembly tool, which has been great. I mean, I, th I think I like to use a text template because it gives students the flexibility to, to uh, the template itself will respond more dynamically to, to what the user will type into the program versus using a PDF. There's a, there's a, I guess, just sort of a, a bit of background. There's two different ways you can set up the, the template, whether it's a PDF that you scan in and sort of cut up and introduce the variables that way. Or um, if you use something like the text template, and I've always found like, I, I want a little more customization on the formatting in the text template, but that's just, you know, that's just me like splitting hairs. Um, so that would be the one thing that I could change uh, if I would. Um, and then just generally, obviously, you know, generative AI is really top of mind for a lot of people, you know, both in uh, academia and also certainly in the profession. It's really what we're, we're, we're getting a lot of questions about. My colleague, Dan Katz has really done a lot of work on this and we're, you know, the law lab itself, we're getting a lot of interest about this, this particular technology. Right. And I think that's, this is something that I think uh, more so than other technologies we've seen in the past it has, I think some legitimate staying power. So, you know, that, that's something that I think instructors should be uh, aware of not not only for what it pretends for future lawyers and their practice, but also just like how students are using it in in their law school careers. Will they be using ChatGPT as part of their courses? Do you know to what extent um, do institutions allow that? And 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 um, whether we embrace the the challenge of trying to figure out how to use this technology um, usefully, or if it's something that we just um, kind of put off to the side. And I would certainly, I, I, I'm much in the camp of, you know, embracing the challenge of, of introducing students to it now because they're going to be using it. It's, it's, it's like, you know, you wouldn't tell a student not to use a cell phone because there are rotary dial phones still out there in the wild, right? Like we, we want, we want students to use the technology that's out there and we want them to use it in a positive way, in a meaningful way. And, and I think it's, it's our job as in, you know, um, in law schools to, to, teach them to embrace that. And then, you know, the technology that, that we've been using for a long time, like document assembly, it's not going away, right? I mean, I think there are different variations of it. Like you can use A2G author as the baseline for teaching students how to, teaching students about chatbots, for example, like a lot of the, the principles that go into building something using rules-based AI, you can use across other platforms, right? It's not just because you teach document assembly, that's the only thing you're going to teach. Um, you can You can really use that as a springboard to talking about other technologies out there. So that's, I think that's, I guess my answer is both, you know, current and forward looking to, to, um, to te technologies like generative AI, but then also not forgetting that we have longstanding technology that has been effective for many years that we should continue to teach, continue to expose students to. I love that. The idea of um, old technology can still work, right? It's still, you, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, use what's been working. Um, I was just with my kids in the national parks in Montana and they saw for the first time actual phones, like pay phones that you could <laughs> use. 
What's and they that? were... I, they were needed though because there's no cell sub reception yeah. there right in the parks and so like that that's how you actually have to communicate so there are things that can still work i'm going to open it up for questions if anyone has it as uh you're thinking about it i'm just going to uh highlight the fact that this series continues for the next two months where our summer series also has an august component with uh allison ludley from the community Legal Education of Ontario, talking about how in Canada they are building their guided pathways using A to J author and how um, they're hoping to expand that beyond Ontario. And then uh, Scott Emery is joining us in September. We're cheating a little on the, the summer general definition there, but September 10th, Scott is joining us from the Kentucky courts and how their program, uh, they were, they didn't have anything before COVID and then the pandemic hit and they realized obviously they needed to go online. And now they have a very robust document assembly project that is getting a lot of publicity for their court system in both the local news, local government, that kind of thing. So if you want to continue the conversation, Alex's email is here uh, on the screen. If you want to talk to him more about how he's using uh, or teaching a course like this, or uh, you can always feel free to reach out to me. We have a section of our website devoted to law schools and uh, the ways that other law schools are doing it in terms of we talked about two credit courses, four credit courses, you know, speaking in just one class, a whole semester long thing. We have a lot of resources to help support you as you start on your document assembly uh, project. Just wanted to thank Alex for talking about this, for joining us, for continuing to talk about uh, and, and to teach A to J author in, in the law school courses. Thank you, Jessica. It's always a pleasure. And thank you to everybody uh, joining the webinar. And again, wish you all the best and 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 go for it. Go for it if you if you want to do it. Uh, A2G Author is a great way to, to, to teach law students just generally, but also to help teach them about the justice gap. So really, really oh. a big fan. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, I'm not seeing anything in the chat or any uh, unmute. So uh, thank you, Alex. And thank you for everyone who attended. And hopefully see you all next uh month in August. Take care, everybody. Bye.